Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Second video, uh, second Zoom on integration. Why do we integrate? What to integrate? And how do we integrate all the subjects? Now we've got the good introduction. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right. Last week, we touched on the fact that education is an atmosphere. And if you remember, I touched upon how atmosphere is often created by us and we set the tone and we set the vibe for our homeschool, um, for our days and uh, the relationships that we have with our children. Um, on a personal note, I live on a small homestead and we moved like three years ago and we jumped into having animals there's no animals here but we're like okay we have a barn so let's let's uh let's have animals and so I've always wanted sheep I've always loved sheep I mean we were living in the suburbs we had only a Bichon Poodle um and I'm talking about that because I've had to learn how to uh behave and to train my animals and so as for our atmosphere, to, to compare it, I guess we can compare it with how children are because children are very intuitive and to, to the you know, emotions of the day. And they, um, they learn best from their environment. Um, and, and animals can be very intuitive as to how we are in our state of our emotional state. Um, and so I wanted to just say that with animals, it's kind of the same thing. And today we're going to go into what uh, is discipline and kind of the same way we have to train our animals, uh, the same way we have to train our children in a sense, um, get to know them, but also uh, train them. So when we had our sheep, uh, I didn't know how to be, um, but I realized really quickly that if I'm an, I was in a rush to do my chores uh, and in a rush to take them out, then they would just bolt and they were just all out of sorts. Um, so that's one way that I had to kind of like check my vibe and then establish routines every day, do the same thing, check my vibe and uh, make sure that everybody knows what's happening next. So when we talk about, we can flip the next one. When we talk about uh, discipline, I uh, love this, Charlotte Mason, this quote from Charlotte Mason. It says, by, uh, by education is a discipline, we mean the discipline of habits formed definitely and thoughtfully, whether habits of mind or body. Psychologists tell us of the adaptation of brain structures to habitual lines of thought, i.e. to our habits. So our habits uh, do influence, uh, no, what I want to say is our habit of mind or, or body influence the brain structure. So um, little habits that I started with, even with my animals, was when I open the door in the morning, I say, good morning, everyone. I always say it in the same way. And I had to be intentional at the beginning and say, okay, I'm going to do that so they know that I'm coming in so that my shepherd, my sheepdog doesn't bark at me uh, and then rile up everybody because there's somebody new in the barn. And so I open the door. It doesn't matter if it's at seven, at eight, or at nine. I open the door, say, good morning, everyone. And now I just do it out of, like, I've established a habit for several days. And now it's just automatic. I don't know why I do it. Now I just do it. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, just little things like that is um, start small with habits. It, now we're... We're training our mind and and body. So memory work is a a um, mem um, I mean the brain is a muscle, and memory work trains the brain. Now everything is so connected. 
um, the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. It's not, it's not moving. <laughs> so when I wanted to train my sheep, uh, I didn't know how to train sheep. So I had to be intentional about it and say, okay, what do I want them to learn? And I'm going to practice doing that every day. Uh, simple things. And I'm going to have my tools. So I wanted them to follow me. I want them to follow me with food. I don't want them to, when I open the door that they run to pasture everywhere and I don't, I can't like lead them to a particular place. So I said, okay, I'm going to have my bowl of food and I'm going to have my stick and I'm going to shake the, the, the food and I'm going to say munchies. So I say munchies and then I shake the food every day when I take to pasture. So I had to think about what, what do I want to do to, to establish this new habit? And I'm going to do it every day, every day consistency. So first one is practice consistency to train and to correct. So discipline means to train and to correct. Uh, I'm, it's the same with our children. We're practicing consistency. Example, I want my child to be able to sit at the table for 10 minutes. I'm going to do, the, I have my tools, I have my, my timer, and I'll have their books ready and they need to sit for 15 minutes or so, depending on the age, whatever you choose, uh, if that's the habit that you want them to, to learn. Um, yeah, so uh, we can go to the next one. The next one is examine yourself. Kids watch you. No, the same, same <laughs> one. So kids watch you. So if you're not doing it, with them they see that you're not and then they don't do it because kids do they, they imitate you they just follow what you're doing so um whatever habits we have created for ourselves we can they can imitate it um next one establish routines one at a time one at a time one at a time not three, four, five. Oh, I want them to do this and this and this and this. And now my homeschool is not the way I want it. And I had all these goals. And so no, uh, it's the same with anything. If you want to change a, a habit in nutrition, you decide I'm going to drink five glass of water today because I don't drink water. I'm going to do that for like two months. Okay. Now after that, it'll be uh, automatic eventually. So just one at a time. Uh, then I love what she says, consider habits of body and mind. Our body influences our mind. So, um, and vice versa, it, when we feed the mind something bad, then it affects our body. And so uh, consider, consider uh, nutrition. How would it affect your mind? Uh, for example, if you're having... Uh, pancakes every morning and Nutella and uh, I don't know, root loops, then, <laughs> then it will have, it will affect the body and therefore not set you up for success for sitting for 15 minutes at the table. So consider, okay, now I know this, this habit influences that habit. So we can take baby steps we're going to do the body and mind first and then we'll consider the 15 minutes sitting at the table if we're able to have a fruit uh fruit and eggs or whatever that's healthier in the morning and then have a reward in the afternoon because we don't need to sit for 15 minutes anyway so consider those that it's all related um and then remember new mercies every day that there's a lot of grace with anything uh, relating to discipline, uh, to train and to correct is should always be done in so much grace um, and so much love as well. To not, uh, it shouldn't be about the child, but about the behavior. And uh, it should be done with love. So that was my portion about discipline and next week we'll do we'll talk about uh, life education is life excellent thank you so much 
I mean, this is directly re can uh, relate to um, integration. So first we're going to talk, we're just going to define integration. So it actually comes from a Latin verb, integrare, and my, uh, I wasn't able to put the macron over the A on RA, which is annoying for me as a Latin teacher, but know that this is a first declension or a first conjugation verb. And uh, integrare means to renew, to refresh, or to make whole which is not uh, necessarily what we think about when we think of integrating subjects, that we're renewing them, we're refreshing them, we're making them whole. It's actually, we get the word integer from the word integrare. And an integer, if you know um, basic math facts, is a whole number. You, uh, an integer is never a fraction or a decimal. It's always a whole number. So when we integrate subjects, uh, students begin to see them as parts of a bigger picture. We don't just study history in isolation. We study it with geography. We study the scientists of that time. We study the art. We listen to the music. We want all, we want everything to be seen as a whole um, because there's no knowledge that occurs in a vacuum and everything is connected. And when we integrate, we see things in a new, fresh way. And so this, we want to practice like, uh, Charlotte Mason uh, talks about one of her principles is the science of relations uh, or relationships. She wants students to be able to make these connections or see the relationships between um, all of the things in their world. So as parents, we we can't get in the way of them making those natural connections on their own, those, re those relationships. What we want to do as parents is we want to train ourselves to see those connections. And then we can model that for our students. So we don't we don't put the history sentence in front of them and then and then um while we're doing that history sentence, well, do you see? Do you see how that relates to this? Do you see how this we can see that, but we want to the part of laying the feast in front of them and giving them these opportunities is allowing them to form those connections with the things, with all of the things, right? So why do we integrate subjects? First of all, it lessens your workload. So that's what we are all about um, at Invictus. Mary and I, we want to make your life easier. And so if you can learn to integrate subjects, then it can simplify your life and you can focus on the things that you really want to do in your homeschool. It teaches, again, students to see how everything is connected. And this is a discipline that they can actually um, develop um, to open their eyes to see these thing, these connections all around them. It refreshes a subject in the mind. So you, you, when you see these, when you try to integrate things, you can say, oh, well, I, okay, I see that kind of in a new way now because uh, you're coming at it kind of from the, a back door or a side door or maybe a tiny little trap door or a window, right? And it gives you just a new kind of vision for what it is you're learning about. And it also demonstrates the interrelatedness of God's creation and mighty hand through time. He does not, God does not exist in a vacuum. He, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end to the world that he has created. And nothing is outside of his realm. Nothing happens by surprise. Everything is connected. So that's just a couple of reasons why we try to focus on integration of subjects. But then you, you ask yourself, okay, well, what right? What's the what of integration? And we want to always begin with the word of God because the word of God touches everything. So you can always uh, find ways to integrate scripture in with what you're, what you're teaching. And we don't want to uh, just a little side thing here. We don't want to force integration, right? We want it to happen organically so if there's a way, like when we talk about other, when we talk about some of these subjects as we go through, if you're, if you're in your homeschool and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to integrate this. I need to integrate this. No, no, you don't have to feel stressed about that at all. Like Miriam was saying in the beginning, choose one thing. Okay. To, I'm going to practice integrating grammar this week. And you're not going to worry about anything else. This is not a time for you to get stressed out about, oh, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing all this integration. Right. So just a side note there, this is not a legalistic thing where you have to check all the boxes and integrate every subject or you have failed. Not at all. Not at all. OK, but again, start with scripture. 
This is from week nine suggested reading uh, when we're learning about ancient Assyria. So this psalm was chosen because it talks about some of the, uh, well, some of the ideas that you can talk about when you're going through learning about Assyria. So we start at uh, uh, verse 13 says, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. So that's good people and bad people, right? The king, and we're talking about King Ashurbanipal in this, in the history sentence this week. So the king, even King Ashurbanipal is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation and by its great might, it cannot rescue. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm just for sake of time. But if you start with this in the morning as part of your morning time, then this is a touchstone that you can come back to through the whole day, through the whole week. If you want, you want to make this the focused reading for each morning, it's a great way that you can integrate with the subjects. Okay, so next one. Um, that's just the end of the psalm. So after scripture, you want to try to bring in, your, here's your history and geography. So this is the way that uh, Invictus can be a spine, right? That jumping off point for all of your other things. So you bring in history and geography, just talked a little bit. So you, you listen to the song, you use your different modalities that we talked about last week. Um, and then you can ask when you're done with a sentence, does this remind you of anything from our Bible reading today? And if they're like, no, you're like, okay, you don't have to push it. You don't have to give them the answer to it. You know, you just ask, does it remind you of it? And then through the week, as you're, as you're going through, you know, perhaps it will bring something to their mind, right? Or oh, what did it say? Do what, what, if you're reading Psalm 33, like every day, uh, that week, then it's going to get started getting into their heart, right? And into their mind. And so at some point, hopefully they're going to make this connection, but maybe not this week, maybe next week, or maybe with a completely different Psalm right? The, the point is you're putting it in front of them and then you're asking the question and then you're letting them make that connection. Okay. Again, you don't want to force it. So that's a way to bring in history geog and geography or history and geography with um, your uh, scripture. And then of course you want to always be integrating geography with history as much as you can, because history doesn't, history happened in a geographic location. So the more you can contextualize the history, the better. So this is kind of like the no-brainer integration portion of our curriculum. Uh, you always want to kind of bring history uh, or geography into how it relates with history. And then after you've done that, here's your, we have a read aloud list for every week. So we're learning about uh, the Assyrian Empire on week nine. So one of our read aloud suggestions is the Revenge of Ishtar which is a story about Gilgamesh, a Mesopotamian Assyrian king, right? And it is a perfect read aloud. There's actually three in the series that you can just be reading through the week as you're learning about it. Now, again, you don't have to force those connections. You're just reading these aloud and you're seeing maybe they make those connections, right? So that's your read. And there's a whole list of read alouds there. And then you go to your picture study, music study, and lists, and I'm just going to flip to the next slide because this is our picture study for week nine. This is the, this is titled um, the something of the Assyrian king. It just, uh, it just escaped me. The uh, the diversion. Diversion, yes, the diversion of an Assyrian king. So Ashurbanipal, the great king of Assyria, was known for being a lion hunter. So we chose this picture study to integrate with our history sentence. So it makes it whole, right? It makes that history sentence whole or it refreshes it. So uh, they, you do the history sentence and then they're looking at this, the picture study through the week, wherever you've placed it. And they're like, oh, wow, this is, this is, could be what it looked like for King, Ass uh, the King of Assyria to be going on a lion hunt, right? In his own arena. It's not much of a hunt. He's just kind of standing there, but you kind of get the idea. It it make it brings uh, the the history sentence full circle, so that you're not just learning it in isolation. Okay, so picture study. So read alouds, picture study, and then we have 
uh, don't poetry. You don't want to forget poetry. So the poetry selection for week nine is actually talk is actually the third stanza of a poem about ancient Egypt. But we get into Assyrian uh, topic poetry in week nine. And it, this is the beginning of the destruction of Sennacherib by George Gordon, Lord Byron. And week this 11. Is, oh, sorry. Week 11. Yes. Yeah. And this poem is about uh, King Sennacherib who came down. Uh, if you, you read about it in the book of Kings and uh, is destroyed by the angel of death. Right. And so they might not get this in week nine, but when it's introduced to them in week 11 and you're saying the Assyrian came down, they're really like, wait a minute, we learned about the Assyrian empire a few weeks ago. Oh, wait, what do we remember about that? And Oh, that was King Ashurbanipal we were talking about. And this is Sennacherib. Well, is there a relationship between those two kings? Well, there actually is. They were uh, in the family line. So um, Ashurbanipal was Sennacherib's great grandfather. Yes. So you can talk about that. Or if you have older students, you can say, hey, why don't you go find out who Sennacherib is and see if he has any connection to Ashurbanipal, right? So that's a way to bring poetry in to your history uh, topic, okay, for that week. And you all, and you can also see this beautiful picture study that goes along with it uh, uh, that uh, Miriam included because there's always room for more art. <laughs> Although I cropped the bottom because I was a naked person. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's okay. All right, next one. Let's talk about science. So science and math, you can integrate together super easily. I'm just going to quickly go through here. So this is the fact that they learned for science on week nine was a spider. Spiders are an arthropod. Spiders have eight legs, two body parts, head and abdomen. So I'm just going to fly through that slide. Here's your math facts, which is sums of 10. You're just going to be chanting those through the week. You can um, use lots of different things, flashcards and stuff to uh, practice these math facts. And then you have your grammar. What does an adjective do? An adjective modifies a noun or a pronoun by describing, qualifying, or limiting. And you're just chanting that through the week and having them learn it. And then you have, okay, so here we go. So here's ways you can integrate those things. Use the history prompt, poetry, hymns, and science facts for narration dictation and copy work. So once you are past basic letter formation for either uh, manuscript writing or cursive writing, uh, so you just get one of the dollar store, you know, menu, how to form your letters, you can then use the things within the guide for copy work to practice that handwriting. You can use them for dictation. So Charlotte Mason was a huge fan of dictation. So you can uh, read the history sentence and slowly and clearly. And while you're read, when, when you're done reading, you say, okay, now write what you heard. And so you can use that history sentence to practice dictation. You can have, you can have them take that history sentence and write it out in their cursive, uh, handwriting to practice copy work. You can do the same thing with the science fact. You can do the same thing with the poetry. So every week they're, they're right. They're adding a new stanza to their hymn or their poem in, in beautiful handwriting. So by the end of the year, they have, they've written, handwritten out all the poems, all the hymns. Now they haven't done it all at one time because you don't want to overwhelm them like that. Right? So it could be that you're, if the kids are young, you're just doing one line through the week, you know, and then by the end of the year, you're doing maybe four lines through the week. You decide based on your own students' uh, level how you want to scale the work. But you can have all of your students doing the same copy work or the same dictation, but just expecting different things from them. Um, you can use a list. So for week nine, it's the list of the 12 tribes of Israel. You can use the list for spelling if you uh, don't want to follow a separate spelling curriculum. Uh, you can use them for spelling practice. You can also, if you're trying to teach alphabetical order, it's a great, these lists are great opportunities to teach about alphabetical order. And you can also, if you have older students, have them pick one of the 12 tribes or a person or one of the topics that we cover in those lists and, they, and use it as a research topic to uh, write a paper or do an oral narration about it or a project 
uh, there's lots of ways you can incorporate those lists into uh, other uses, not just memorize the list, right? You want to use this information and have them interact with it. And then use the picture study, the diversion of the Assyrian king. You can use that uh, not just for connection to the history sentence, but also for oral and written narration. So you can, when you do picture study, uh, you can just say, tell me what you see. And that's an oral narration. Oh, well, I see a king and he's standing on sand and he's in an arena and there's a dead lion right there. And he's got his bow raised and he's about to shoot this other lion. And so they're just, they're narrating. They're telling you what they see from the picture study. Um, you can also use it for written narration. So write about what you see. And so they can write about it. And then you can also use it for art appreciation. If you want to start talking about art theory, or if you want to look at texture, uh, symmetry, um, the other, uh, you know, two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, uh, you depending on the age of your child and their capabilities, right? Um, you can also do imi art imitation with the picture study. So you can say, okay, um, here's your picture study we've been studying with. Why don't you draw a king? with hunting some lions, right? Or if you've got a girl, you could say, why don't you draw a queen hunting some lions? And you're imitating that great art piece. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. You're just using it as a jumping off point. And then you can also compare it. So if you wanna, um, there's other picture, there's other picture studies that have kings in them through the, uh, in our picture study collection. So you can put them side by side and you can do a comparison, right? So that would be for your, probably for your older students. So the picture study can be used in lots of different ways. And I'm sure you can all think about ways to use it too. This, like I was saying before, the science and the math can go together. Uh, if you're, if uh, around October, you know, Halloween time, you can go to the dollar store and get little plastic spider manipulatives, which is what uh, Miriam did and practice your math facts with, so this sums of 10. So as long as you have enough to make 10 as your sum, and you can, and you have a pile of spider, plastic spiders over here to make like two plus eight, right? You can use spider manipulatives to do your um, math facts together. And sometimes you can even find that the uh, manipulatives that you're using aren't accurate in terms of how they've been uh, molded in the factory. So some spiders may not have their eight legs where they should, or they might've given them three body parts or whatever. And so you can pay attention to that too and see if your kids uh, notice. And then the grammar integrates easily with many subjects, especially history and science. So I'm gonna focus on a little bit of, of the grammar right now. So uh, sentence. And so okay, apart from when you're doing the history, okay, this is, this is now a grammar portion, right? You can say, hey, you know, we've been doing that um, ancient history sentence, can you find the adjectives uh, in this, in the sentence? And can you, you know, can you remind me what an adjective does and, and then go on an adjective hunt? And so what I've done is I've underlined the adjectives that are in this sentence. So uh, you could have them, if they're practicing their handwriting, you can at, in a separate, at a separate time, you say, hey, let's, let's look at the sentence you did for ancient Assyria. Let's take a highlighter. Can you find, can you find the adjectives there? Tell me about ancient Assyria. Okay, and what kind of Assyria? Ancient Assyria. You know, between 1900 BC and 612, the Assyrians became the most powerful people in Northern Mesopotamia. Um, sorry, my son, I'm in my car right now, as you can probably see, <laughs> driving my son to college for his sophomore year. And he's sitting beside me and he's in the sun and he's boiling hot. So he wants to turn up the air conditioner, but... Um, I don't know if it's too loud, but anyway, that's what's happening. That's why I'm like pawing over here on this side. <laughs> so you go, you use your history sentence for uh, adjective or grammar integration. So what empire? The empire. What king? The king. Great king, right? And so you don't have to go out and find a grammar problem for your elementary age student. Just use whatever the grammar fact is for Week and and have fun with it with all of the stuff that you're doing. So that's for your uh, that's for the 
history sentence. But what about grammar integration with your spider sentence, right? Spider's an arthropod. Uh, an article adjective. Spiders have eight legs. How many legs? Eight. Adjective. Two body parts. How many body parts? Two, right? So you can, this is another thing. You, If you've written that out, you just go and you highlight those different adjectives and you have fun that way. And then uh, Miriam is going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can integrate Greek. You got to unmute yourself, Miriam. Okay, Nicole. <laughs> uh, with Greek, um, it doesn't always have to be integrated. Not every subject has to be integrated. But I would say that Later on, there is all the numbers that are easy to integrate. So that all of those numbers could be used either in, in a, let's say, for, for example, the science sentence, that would be easy. Um, I think that it's octo and deca, or maybe that's in Latin. Hmm. I can't remember. Anyways, um, anyway, so you can do that. Uh, otherwise, we have the fine arts and the science, and I know that Nicole was very intentional using uh, Greek wherever, and I believe in this week, we are doing, this week, uh, it's Stonehenge of England, and in Stonehenge, she did include the Greek for the monoliths, and it says mono from the Greek monos so mean which means single so you can you can do it this way oh oh we lost nicole oh there she is <laughs> what happened we were kind of losing you a, a little bit at the end there before we switched over so maybe that's what happened Sorry about that. That was just a technical glitch in the yeah. machine. Yep. Did you get through? I'm sorry. I'll bring my. I did get through. Great. It wasn't. It wasn't much to say. Um, just that not every subject has to be integrated every week. Yes. But and if this you is want to, time. yeah. Yeah. I mean, if if you're trying, you know, like I said before, you're trying to do one thing at a time, right? Greek is probably going to be your very last thing that you ever wow. need to think about in terms of integration. Now, when we get into, um, when we get into, uh, why, why I'm just, why having trouble with technology. one second. Also, also the one, um, the one thing that we have to remember is that all the integration is not to, to complicate things, right? We have to remember the beginning, it's supposed to simplify things. So if it's complicated for you to like figure out the, like, how do we do that? Do I have to integrate everything? No, it's not the goal. The goal is that it makes your life simpler and easier. So. Yes, absolutely. We're, this is kind of like fire hose. How can you integrate? Right. What can you integrate? Um, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, you do not have to do all of the integration across the board, right? right? You might, you just, have to do the things that come easiest for you first and then practice adding just one thing in never let it never let the curriculum control you you yeah. control the curriculum right yeah. so you're the one in charge not the curriculum not me not miriam we're not no. telling you what to do <laughs> we're just showing you ways that you can use exactly. what invictus offers you mm -hmm. okay so that's greek it's all greek to me and then finally, we have created uh, hands-on lesson, uh, hands-on fine arts and science guides that have uh, detailed and beautiful lessons that directly integrate with the science and the history. So this is where you don't have to go and find something to be like, oh, I need a hands-on project for ancient Egypt. I mean, I see it all the time on face in my Facebook groups, right? And oh, I need some hands-on science things for my second grader. And I'm like, oh, this is exactly why we did this for why we wrote these. 
It's so you can take everything, well, not everything. You can, you can take these specific things from the curriculum and you can do that hands-on project that makes that um, fact or that topic just come a little bit more alive, Ma refreshes it or makes it whole, right? You're studying about Stonehenge. Well, you get to make some air dry clay or sand clay and you get to build a Stonehenge, um, you know, circle, a Stonehenge circle with your, with your kids. So, uh, you know, you're learning about photosynthesis in science. You get to do an experiment uh, that demonstrates photosynthesis in plants and it's all done for you. Like it's all there. So we've done that part for you. We've done all the heavy lifting for you and uh, super easy to integrate in that way. Uh, did you want to add anything about, about that, Miriam, with these guys or you want to move on? No, that's pretty good. We do have a question in the chat. Okay. So we can read that. She said, uh, it's Chris, Kristen shared, um, speaking of read aloud, I was wondering if anyone had any suggestion for a book that talks about the continents of the world for read one. She couldn't find one um, with the suggestions that we have. So oh, did it's you... kind of overwhelming with the options at the library a little bit. Um, but would, would an atlas kind of be... Or just a map of the world be a good integration? It's not a read aloud, but. Well, I think, I mean, for that week, I think what we had done um, for week one in terms of, oh, continents of the world for kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're just trying to reinforce the seven continents and the oceans and any kind of, yeah, so an atlas would be fine for that. It's not exactly a read aloud. Um so but i i also used um i didn't have a read aloud for that but i used a puzzle i had two puzzles that i had found of of the map of the world um they're pretty easy to find and, and they're good to have in your homeschool because every year it comes back um if if you're doing um middle ages we still have the map of the world the first week and the third as well and fourth so that's a yes. kid constant thing yeah yeah and i mean we're all if you find a good read aloud or like we're always open to suggestions for mm -hmm. uh read aloud stuff to add because we have a we have a um an online like in our resources list we've got a we've got read alouds there so uh and again you don't have to do you don't have to feel like you have to have a read aloud for every single uh topic that's mm -hmm. covered as well right because that can be that can be a stress on you too, where you're like, oh my gosh, I want to do a Charlotte Mason education. I'm supposed to be doing read aloud and narration and I'm learning about continents of the world. And so I need a read aloud for that week, right? And, or a living, a living book for that week. And I've got to read aloud for history and I've got to read aloud. You know, you don't have yeah. to, you don't have to do it for everything, mm -hmm. right? You want to be strategic in that. Don't overwhelm yourself and don't overwhelm your students with so much read aloud that you want to die and they want to die right everything in moderation you know you don't want to you don't want to overload them so if you can't find a read aloud that goes with the geography that week just don't even worry about it you know read about some myths from different continents and you can say oh well this is a myth from africa right and you've you've done a read aloud for geography in a in a roundabout way is there anything else? I see a little chat box there. Anything, any other questions in the chat box, Miriam? Are we good? No, and no other questions. Okay. Um, but if you if you have any questions, we're we're an email away. Um, thank you for chiming in. Um, and hopefully we'll get this recording on YouTube as well for all the other ones that were not able to join us today. So Thank you very much for chiming in again. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Kristen. Hope you guys have a great week and we will see you next week. Yeah. Uh, for narration, sure. why, what, and how. And for Miriam's uh, blurb on education is a life. Great. All right. Thank, thank you, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.